Hi, I'm Mark Kelly. Welcome to the show. Well, this week the country heard a harrowing tale of Milan Egermeyer, a Canadian shot and killed by attackers on his sailboat in Honduras, and of his daughter Maida, who survived, who found the courage to scare off her father's killers with a flare gun and was left adrift in rough seas for about 18 hours before being rescued. Tonight you'll hear from Maida herself about what happened on that boat. The first time she spoke to anyone in the media about her story, a story that began not as a nightmare, but as a dream voyage. Milan had been living that dream for almost two years. A sailboat cruise along the coast of North America. And early last month, 24-year-old Maida joined her father's adventure. On November 26, they set out from Guatemala, headed first for the Honduran island of Attila, known for its spectacular diving, and then on to Panama. But they didn't make it. On December 2nd, a violent storm forced them to take refuge in a lagoon. And instead of safety, there they found a different kind of danger. And what should have been a trip that father and daughter would remember fondly forever came to a fateful and fatal end. Until now, the media has only been able to speculate on what happened or reconstruct it from second-hand accounts. The only person who can help us understand the raw, devastating reality of that experience is Maida herself. And she agreed to an exclusive interview with Connect. I met her in Sudbury this afternoon to hear her remarkable story. So when you arrived, how did, how did things start? Um, well, I arrived in Guatemala City, <clears throat> and from there we went to Rio Dulce, which is where he kept his boat. He lived on the boat, um, and the plan was to sort of, you know, see where he'd been living the last year and a half, um, and prepare the boat for the trip. And tell me about your dad. <laughs> um, my dad a, was a great guy. He... He really liked the outdoors. Um, he liked, you know, when we were kids, we he built us forts and made us Quincy's in the snow time. And, uh, you know, he was that guy you could go to with any question if you needed help or advice or just um, somebody to listen to you and drop everything to kind of go over what you were concerned about with. And... He like he just really enjoyed sort of the <clears throat> the smaller things in life, I guess, like the sunset and good food and good company. And uh, I think when he was in the Rio Dulce, <clears throat> he really gained an appreciation for for that s simple style of life and the community there. And I think he made a lot of close friends when he was there. Oh. We left um, where his boat was anchored on a Friday and spent until Monday kind of winding our way down the river to the port of Livingston where the ocean meets the river and um, from there we spent a night in a place called Tres Puntas, Honduras. So these were just sort of anchorages off of off of the land, no marina, just drop the anchor and have a meal and the next day pick it up again and head to the, you know, head as far as you can or want to, basically. So <clears throat> we went to Tres Puntas and then Omoa and um, and then the next day our, our plan was to head to Utila, which is an island off of Honduras, um, about a 12-hour trip. What kind of bad weather were you facing? Um, just really heavy winds, high winds, choppy waves, like dark skies, the visibility wasn't that great. Um, you could see that the rain was coming and when we turned around the point to head to our destination it was just pouring rain and you couldn't see hardly a hundred meters in front of the boat. You just mm -hmm. wanted to get there, I, I imagine. Yeah, yeah. so after we went through that and it looked like there was more storms coming, we thought we would um, head for a place called Lagoon El Diamante, and that was sort of a sheltered lagoon on the coast, um, but in that same area where it was sort of recommended not to visit. And had you discussed the, the trade-off that you needed to get shelter, but... We had discussed that, and um, we thought that 
you know, if, if we just went there for the night, we could leave in the morning and that would be okay and we'd take the necessary precautions. But at that point, we were afraid that, you know, something worse could happen being out there in the weather. So we took that chance. So what happened? So you had, had bunked down for the night? Yep, and we, we s everything was fine, and in the morning um, the, we the winds were really high, and the weather wasn't looking good either, so we made the decision to stay another night um, where, where we were sheltered from the wind. And um, so we had like a, a pretty good day just relaxing and reading and talking a lot about him telling me a lot of stories. And around 5, 5 p.m., we saw a boat approaching, um, approaching the lagoon at first, and they, they went to one shore. And you could see there were four men in it, um, but there had been other fishing boats sort of in the area as well, so n no sort of alarm bells went off then. Um, but when they started coming closer, they um, they were actually approaching the boat, which was the first time that had happened with any of the other boats, and they didn't really look like nice people. Mm. Yeah. So the alarm bells went off at that point. Yeah, they did for me, and we were we were sitting, you know, just sitting in the cockpit when they came up, and we just kind of kept calm, and they they had the lid off of their their motor of their boat and they said oh we're having one of them spoke English I, I speak some Spanish but he spoke English to to us asking you know our engines broken do you have a screwdriver and so my dad went down and got a screwdriver and he said no no I want another screwdriver not that kind of screwdriver my dad went down and got another screwdriver and um, then he asked for a knife to fix the engine, and that's really when things started getting a little suspicious, I guess, more than, you know, that feeling that you get inside anyways when something doesn't feel right. I already had that, but after they asked for the knife, it was just like, oh, something like this isn't good. Did you say anything to your dad at that point? Um, no. We just sort of looked at each other. Um, and I knew he had a knife on his pocket, you know, like a jackknife kind of. And he went down anyways into the boat and came back up. And he undid it and handed it over to the guy. <coughs> he went to the engine and went to fix whatever. I, To be honest, I think that was just a ploy. Um, but... And then he came back and looked as though he was fiddling with it, like he couldn't really figure out how to put it back. And so my dad leaned over and he said, no, you're not doing that right. Like, give it to me, I can, I'll put it back for you. And he, when he leaned over, uh, I guess one of the other guys felt threatened and he pulled out a handgun and shot him in the chest four times. Four times. just just because he was asking for help, you know, to help him and, you know, help him with the engine. So I couldn't believe it. And he, I, can, I can still hear the gun in my ear. He just uh, did it. And, and I jumped into the sailboat because I was scared and I didn't know what was happening. And... I when I saw my dad fall, I, I went out to be like, Dad, are you okay? Like, I, I didn't cross my mind that someone did, had just shot him. Um, and they were still still in the boat, and, and he was down, and uh, I saw that he'd brought the flare gun and put it behind me, I think, when he went to go get the knife. And so I picked it up, and I just yelled at them, and I, like, waved the gun at them and I think they thought it was real. Thank God because they took off fairly quickly after that. What, what did you yell at them? I said like, what did you do? Like, what have you done? So, 
I don't know if they heard that. I just maybe it was just the gun that made them take off. I don't know. Did you fire the gun? No. I didn't know how. <laughs> Where was your dad at this point? He was in um in the cockpit, sort of. He just collapsed. Um. So I. You know, I, after they left, I went over and I tried to feel if he was, you know, still alive. Because I could see the wounds and I, I didn't think they were that serious. You know, I just hoped that he was going to be okay, but he was gone. Yeah. That quickly? Yeah. Like how much, uh, like how long a period of time are we talking? Like a minute. Wow. Yeah. So... I don't know what happened then, but it, something kicked in, and I I tried to you know lay him back. It's so stupid, you know, to make him comfortable or something. <laughs> and and then I thought, you know, what if they come back for me? You know, there's a lot of people. If someone's gonna kill somebody over asking for a knife to help put the knife away, what would they do for things on a boat, if they know I'm the only one there. So I put the life, a life jacket on, my dad's life jacket, and grabbed the survival kit, and I just sat waiting for them. You expected they were going to come back? So I just watched the one opening of the lagoon, it was a small opening, and I just listened as hard as I could for any sound of an engine, like any motor, boat sound, and I just watched for them, ready to just jump off the boat if I saw anybody come back. Were you holding the flare gun at that point? Oh yeah, didn't leave my hand. Hmm. And how long did that come on for? Um, well, I sat there for about 20 minutes and I was like, okay, I have to do something like I need help and um, like I know you can mayday on the VHF radio that they have in the boat so but I didn't know how to do it and so I found the manual don't ask me how <laughs> and you know figure out what channel I needed to be on what I was supposed to say I had I went to the GPS and found my coordinates and um, and I called in. Who did you call? Um, I just said, you know, Mayday, Mayday, and the people that picked up were the Honduran Coast Guard. Um, a woman named Debbie Prieto, I found out later. But I called her Debbie, and she said she was going to help me out, and it's going to be okay. How, how were you feeling uh, I mean, at that point alone on the boat? How did you feel? Did you feel vulnerable? Uh, totally. I, I just felt all alone and um, really afraid, like just scared. Cause I need, like, there's nothing there, there's nobody, there's no town, there's no help. I'm in the middle of nowhere. Incredibly, what came next for Maida Egermeyer may have been even more difficult. The rest of her story, right after this. Stay with us. Welcome back. Well, before the break, you heard the first part of Maida Egermeyer's ordeal. Armed men approaching her father's sailboat on the Honduran coast and gunning him down. Maida scaring them off with nothing but a flare gun in her guts. And finally, you heard how she carefully arranged her father's body and sat in the boat anchored in stormy seas with no sailing experience, completely, utterly alone. And that's where she picks up her story. When daylight came, she asked me on the on the radio, do you have a cell phone? Because the radio connection was bad. And I found my dad's cell phone, gave her the number. So she was able to call me and I called my mom um, from that number, sort of, these are my coordinates. If you can help me, please, you know, I need help. What this is what happened. What did you tell your mom at that point? I said, 
Dad, Dad's killed, Mom, and I, I need help. I'm here, and these are my coordinates. And then the phone cut out. I don't know what, um, what got me the help, whether it was my mom's phone call or the Honduran Coast Guard or, or if it was um, that button. But finally, in, at like one in the afternoon, I saw a plane fly overhead. And I saw USCG. And I was so happy. So I said on the radio, Debbie, they found me. Okay. So that was like a really amazing moment, yeah. Because I felt like I was gonna be okay. Um, you know, I'm gonna see my family again. How long had it been since your dad had been shot to the time you saw that plane? Um. I guess, like, let's see, 12, 17 hours, 18 hours, and, um, they contacted me by that radio and, you know, asked me if, you know, am I injured, do I have fuel, do I have water, do I have food, um, like, what's my situation, and they just kept me company and they just circled and circled um, and tried to arrange some sort of strategy for me to get rescued um, so they tried <laughs> and they tried to contact the Honduran military um, helicopter and they couldn't communicate with them I don't know what happened there but they couldn't seem to get a hold of anybody or get an actual estimated time um, and luckily there was a, a tanker, a, a British tanker that had, had been in a nearby town and was heading towards Billy's that heard the Coast Guard on the radio and said, you know, we can, we can help. What were you finding within yourself when you were put in this situation? I don't know. Um... I guess I just had a lot of hope that things are going to be okay. So it was just like, you can get through this. You know? And, uh, I'd taken this necklace off of my dad and that was, um, I felt like that had given me sort of his, his strength. He always sort of knew what to do in those situations, so... Come on, Dad, help me. <laughs> yeah. So that that was kind of, I think, what, what kept me going. And I don't know if I'd had to wait another night there by myself. If I hadn't seen that plane, I don't know if I could have held it together much longer because I was exhausted and, like, every sense of mine was just heightened to, like, as much as possible. And it's like... I I don't know, I know just being so tense and scared for so long is hard to handle. Mm -hmm. So when did you know that you were safe? Um, well, it was getting dark, it was 4.30, the sun sets at 6, and the Coast Guard airplane still wasn't back to do the flyover and they were still refueling. So the tanker was on radio with me and they said, we're getting a little nervous, it's getting dark. Um, we're gonna, I think we're gonna drop the rescue boat and come and get you. But I knew that was gonna be kind of risky because they didn't know how to get to me and the waves were really rough out there. Um, so I said, you know, I think I can sail it, the boat out at least, or nav not sail it, but motor it out at least as far as you guys are, I can try anyways. And um, they said they'd walk me through it if I had any problems, that they'd be there, you know, and encourage me. And if I had didn't know what I was doing, they'd help. 
so I cut the anchor because I didn't have the strength to pull it up and um, went out the got out of the lagoon and I saw the tanker there and I just headed for it and the boat was just like bouncing up and down it was really windy and but they could see me they said and they kept saying you know you're doing a good job that's you're like try and head for our port side you got it and so I was just you know just holding on and just trying to get there and then my engine died on the boat halfway there I could smell it smoking before it died and I said oh gosh like this would be just so bad and it died, but like they saw me there, right? So, so they said, okay, we're dropping the rescue boat. And these three, three men, three Scotsmen, or at least they sounded Scottish to me, <laughs> um, came, came to get me. So they, <coughs> they went alongside the boat and one guy came on and tried to fix the engine, get it working again, but we were, the waves were just pushing me closer and closer to the rocks. Um, of the cliff of the shore and they said we can't start the engine and I'm really sorry Maida but I think it's getting too dangerous we're gonna we're gonna have to leave your dad behind I know you want him to go with you but I don't we don't have that kind of time we need to get you safe so I jumped in the boat and off we went, and that's when I knew I was safe. Yeah. How hard was that to leave your dad behind? It was awful. Yeah. <laughs> I could just see the boat bouncing towards the shore, <laughs> knowing that he was on it. I'd like it. in my head I said sorry dad I'm sorry <laughs> but um but I know like I know that he if he, if he was if he knew he'd want me to be safe and that was the right decision yeah. you know and and I got on board and they really took care of me they were great. The Tessa PG. And I'll never forget them. Mm -hmm. Just one footnote there. Her uh, father's body was recovered and cremated in accordance with his wishes. He's now back in Canada with his family. As for Maida, the ordeal taught her about her own strength and courage, and she will need it. A funeral will be held for her father this week. Now, the Department of Foreign Affairs is in contact with Honduran authorities as they investigate what happened to Maida and her father. We contacted the department today to find out how that investigation is going. In an email response, a spokesperson says, quote, consular officials on the ground continue to liaise with local Honduran authorities who have jurisdiction over the case. We look forward to the results of the investigation by Honduran officials and hope that it brings answers regarding this matter. Foreign Affairs says it cannot comment further on the case because of the Privacy Act. Maida does not have a lot of hopes that her father's killers will be found. I just want to thank her for talking to us today.